He expertly surveyed a soldier's leg while playing a surgeon, but no one realized who he was until his image emerged in a newspaper article praising his abilities. In primary school, we were always taught that history is a teacher of life. In retrospect, I see how much I missed the point and how little interest I had in history at the time, but that was a long time ago. Long before social media platform existed, there was a con artists and scammers. I talked about influences from before, but around the turn of the 20th century, one of the biggest con artists picked the public curiosity. My name is Mario Bekesh, and I would like to welcome you all to my podcast, Life the Battlefield. I'm the Guinness World Record holder for the longest continuous audio broadcast, 55 hours plus. I spent 1,800 consecutive combat days in war in ex Yugoslavia, and as well, my professional career involves investigation and interrogation of the high position organized crime figures, traitors, spies, and as well, I was working in diplomatic intelligence sector. To top up all of this, I'm the best seller book author, and today we'll talk about the greatest con artist. Guys, don't be taken for the ride. So today we're going to talk about Ferdinand Valdo de Mara and who he was in comparison to other superstars that Grace magazine covers at the time, Ferdinand Valdo de Mara was not well known as an actor, astronaut, hero, or politician. None of this. His professional background has been somehow full of varieties, colorful. Among other things, he was a doctor, professor, jail warden, and a monk. Yeah, that's about what we know. De Mara was not a genius. In fact, he dropped out of school without diploma. And needless to say today, not having school, it's a great thing. Well, that's wrong. He was called the great con artist, bandit who dubbed others into thinking he was a famous. I grew quite intriguing De Mara as a man while reading and researching for my podcast. In contrast to the other con artists and scammers, he did not steal and lie for financial gain. No, he did not. That was long time ago. De Mara was considered, desired to advance in rank and infamy. That's what he was. He desired to become known. Ferdinand Val de Mara was born in the little, little town of Lawrence in the American state of Massachusetts. Yes, 1921, so 100 years ago. In Italy, in his life, he pulled off his first con. He didn't have enough money to buy chocolate at the neighborhood candy store. So he deceived the clerks into giving the class free chocolates. Um, I was as well, I need to insert a little bit myself into this so you can understand where I'm coming from. When you're born in poverty, you want things. And it's not that when you're born in poverty, you just want a big cars or big homes, or anything else. Sometimes we, everything starts, and I start from myself, start from small things, chocolates. When I was born, you know, I was born in very, very poor uh, workers' family, typical communist family, um, and we had nothing, nothing. We just need to be happy. Whatever my mom, she'll pull out, we was like, ooh, it's a Christmas. I wanted chocolate as well. So I was stealing chocolates, and I ended up in juvenile center for the other things as well. So I try to say to you, we all start some career type being little crane or tug or, you know, the thief like a Demara, just because we wanted things. I know the chocolate, it sounds very cheap, you know, it doesn't, doesn't give the value, you have not that money, you know, I can describe chocolate, it's a chocolate, a couple of bucks or whatever it is. But to start, that's how the thing starts, with the small things, everything in life, all beginning, all big things have a small beginnings. Same goes with Demara. Once he felt the adrenaline of a success was come, that's what it is. There was no turning back. Every scammer he has at this adrenaline rush. When monk Demar dropped out of school in 1935, he lacked the required skills to be successful in the groups 
that attracted him. He lacked the patience required to get an SS certification, but he craved the status of being priest, professor, or military officer. And thus, his life of deception began. As we can see today, people will lie to you that they are something or they are not just to belong to the group. The mother ran away from his home in Lawrence, Massachusetts, at the age of 16, claiming to be of the proper age to enter Trappist monastic order. When his parents discovered him, they let him stay since they expected him to be eventually give up. The Mara stayed with the monks long enough to acquire a hood and a habit. When he was 18, he was forced to leave because his fellow monks thought he had bad temperament. Yeah, well, we don't want you anymore, so get out. The Mara then attempted to join the other orders, but again violated the rules. It was also a ruse he employed several times during his career. He even helped to build a religious university on one occasion. As a most young man, what they do, they join the military. So he joined the military, then subsequently to Navy. He joined the army at age 19 in 1941. As we know, the Second World War, it was in full swing second year. But as to now, the army was not for him either. He was so dissatisfied with the military life that he stole a friend's name and deserted, eventually joining the Navy. He worked as a psychology professor <laughs> at the University of Pennsylvania under the bogus name and without degree. He also studied love and the false identity. Now, I, I studied this with a uh, life in Australia. I do remember how often, you know, when I was applying for the jobs, you come, you come for the job interview and they, this recruiter agent, apparently, apparently he done all background checks on you, which is the biggest BS I ever heard. And that's how the perpetrator scammers understand the system. Nothing was checked. Nobody cares till something doesn't go wrong. When you apply for the job, you can have a every degree possible under your armpit. Nobody ask it. Nobody. I've never been asking Australia. Why do you think it's different in the US? Demara in 1940s, he was professor. <laughs> now, Demara was granted permission to pursue medical training while serving in the Navy. Despite passing the prerequisite course, he lack of education stopping him from progressing. Demara then provided his first set of bogus credentials claiming, as I say, the fake, claiming to have earned the necessary college grades to get admitted to medical school. He was so pleased with his creations that he decided to seek for an officer commission rather than medical school. As I say, things are being discovered when things go wrong in most occasions. After his fraudulent documents were discovered, the Mara, you know, faked that he's dead and escaped once more. The Mara pretended to be dead and left when his fraudulent papers were discovered. In 1942, the Mara assumed the persona of Dr. Robert Linton French, a former Navy officer and psychologist. When he worked at the institution, he uncovered French information in old campus brochure that featured French. You know, most often I uh, stipulate this in my podcast because I want, you to, I want to educate you guys. I want you to fall to, to the scam and the fraud is happening online. The fraudsters have the biggest tool on their disposal, and that is their brain. They perceive, they see, they hear, they talk to people. In the last couple of decades, we don't need to be involved into society to learn things. We just go online. And uh, LinkedIn is the greatest thing. LinkedIn is like a new Tinder. But apart from being Tinder, there's a, a lot of white papers talking about how to print a fraud, a scam, all these things. So what the fraudsters do, what the scammers do, spies as well, they're using imagination. They're envisaging, they're imagining things, how they're going to do it, how they're going to do it. And if they're successful, they already know the plan B, how to defend themselves in the case they've been caught and who they're going to blame, how they're going to blame. So the matter was not different. The matter was not different. He used the old campus brochure that featured that gentleman called French, surname French, right? And he took his details and pretended that's him. How you can check till things don't go wrong in life. Don't put everything online in today's DNA age. Do not. Your data, 
it's somebody else's data. By the time you defend yourself and try to convince somebody that you are not uh, that person who will steal identity from you, yeah, well, it's too late. Demara was arrested and convicted for desertion while working as a college lecturer under the French name until the end of the war in 1945. Now, due to his exceptional behavior, he only served 18 months of six-year term, but he returned to his old way up release. Once a criminal, always a criminal. In 21st century, we praise the criminals. They publish the books, they go on Netflix. Well, he will be different. The Mara did what? Change his name to Cecil Haman and enroll to Northeastern University this time. Tired of the effort and time required to complete his legal degree, the Mara earned a doctorate and accepted another teaching position at the Christian College in Maine as a Dr. Cecil Haman in the summer of 1950. It's, it's scary. A surgeon, he becomes a surgeon who doesn't have medical degree. Now, his most famous scam, however, took place on Canadian ship during the Korean War. The guy loves the wars. He worked as a surgeon on a battleship HMS Cayuga as a Dr. Joseph Sir. He only knew about medicine from the text of the ship's other doctor, whom he had forced to write the norms of practice in case he found himself alone on the ship with no other doctor. <laughs> so he asked other doctor to write the procedures. He operated on the 90 Korean troops who had been struck by gunfire and shrapnel on one occasion. Dr. Joseph Sir, C-Y-R, became well known as a result of his exceptional profession, even reaching the genuine, genuine, genuine Dr. Joseph Seed. So there was a real guy, Joseph, who found out in genuine one. Even the fraud was exposed, the Canadian Navy refused to charge the Mara. In order to avoid more scandal and public scrutiny, the Canadian government chose to simply deport the Mara back to the United States in November 1951. After returning to America, word of his exploits spread. Ademara sold the tale to Life magazine in 1952. Sounds familiar? Become the criminal and you get a spotlight. Because why? Because people love those stories. People love the stories. If I'm the criminal, I'm going to be caught and going to be the superstar. If I'm not a superstar barring my podcast, maybe I can sell the some life stories. Imagine the criminals will sell the stories. If I try to sell any of my stories, while I was working in diplomatic intelligence sector, yeah, well, my life will be very, very short. Now, Demara sold his story to Life magazine in 1952. After returning to the United States, he attempts to spend time living under his own name and reforming his habits of behavior. Though he enjoyed the celebrity that came with this, the great con artist character, he gradually began to dislike living as Demara the great con artist. Yeah, so doesn't love the glory of being the greatest con artist. So what he done, Demara took what he can do it, new identity. So in 1955, when he began working as a guard at the Texas jail in Huntsville, he was eventually granted command of the highest security wing, which housed the most dangerous inmates. But year after of his labor, one of the prisons discovered a Life magazine article and handed the jail authorities the Mara cover image. Whoa, welcome to the reality. After being apprehended in North Haven, Maine in 1957, he was sentenced to six months in jail. Well, he's becoming old, he's become tired, and you know, every career has the end. Before his career end, he worked as a chaplain, as a priest at the hospital in Anaheim, California, for his last employer. He was exposed there too, but because he became close friends with the management and one of the hospital owners, he was led to stay. He worked there until 1980, when he gave the final rights to well-known actor Stephen McQueen. Can you imagine this? Last rights to Stephen McQueen. Steve McQueen was dying from uh, lung cancer, if I'm correct. Pretty sure it is. So, 1980, he gave the final anointing to well-known actor Stephen McQueen. 
Ferdinand Valdemara had both of his legs amputated after suffering from diabetes-related heart failure two years, two years prior to his death. Even though Demara had a really interesting life and never really cared about money, which didn't inspire him to succeed in anything he did, in the end, a con artist, it's just a con artist. So guys, Demara is one of the oldest examples of the con artists. Before, you need to do this in person. Today, you're doing online. But if you believe that the life of con artist and one day it's going to be paid off by you appearing in some magazine or some documentary on a social media platform like a Netflix or whatever it is, it's not worth it. Don't do it. I catch many people and guess what? 90.9%, 99.9% of people serve the sentence and they never see the daylight of the freedom in a way they want. Thank you for watching Light the Butterfield. Let me know in the comment section below. What do you think about the Mara? Why he was not after money? Why the guy? And why the all Konatis start small? As a quote says, all big things had small beginnings. Thank you for watching.